awfully easy to be on top of the pile, not so easy to be on the bottom of the pile. Easy to have lots of accolades, not so hot when you don't have any. How on earth are we to live our life? Is it all about what we do? Is it all about our getting recognition? Is it all about our success? Is it all about our popularity? Or is there another way to live life? Well, if you're wondering about this, let me tell you, you're not the first one. Matter of fact, we're gonna take a look today at some of the disciples, and then we're gonna take a look at Jesus. And we're gonna figure out how is it that we're called to live life? Join us on this journey. God bless you. Thank you, choir. You know, we're talking today about service. Thank you for serving the Lord. Uh, we are your second audience. Your first audience is Jesus. 
and thank you so much for singing faithfully for Him and honoring Him. Well, this story comes under, does God answer airmail? Uh, it starts with a guy named uh, Joe Delancey, who was out in his backyard in Cincinnati playing catch. His son Jared's eight years old, and they're tossing the ball back and forth. And Joe, the dad, can tell that his son's thinking about something. Well, they're talking about Reds baseball and talking about school. And, but he can tell something's going on. Finally, his son just blurts it out. He says, Dad, is there a God? Well, the dad thinks about num- multiple possible answers to that one and decides to go for broke and be honest. He said, I don't really know. I went to church a couple times when I was a kid, but yeah, don't know. And the son says, well, does he talk to people? Dad said, don't really know that either. And then the son, Jared, says, wait a second, Dad, I'll be right back. And he dashes into the house. Well, he comes running back out with a Mylar helium-filled balloon that he got at the uh, circus. And he comes uh, out with a piece of paper and a marker. And he writes on the piece of paper, uh, God, if there is somebody who knows about you, would you please send them to tell us about you? Jared. And he ties it to the balloon and lets it go. Well, if you were Joe, the dad, what would you be thinking? You know, he was thinking, oh my gosh, this kid's actually expecting an answer. And he didn't know quite what to do, so they just let the balloon go. Well, a few days later, they were driving through town, and they came across this place that said, free car wash. Well, who doesn't want your car washed for free? So they pull in, and the guy rolls down the line at the window, and Joe, Joe says to him, uh, so how much is a car wash? The guy said, it's like the sign said, it's free. He says, nothing? No, it's nothing. Well, why are you doing that? Well, he says, you know, we're, we're just trying to do something practical to show people God's love. And the dad says, wait a minute. Are you guys Christians? And he said, well, yes. The kind of Christians that believe in God? <laughs> and he said he couldn't help but chuckle a little bit. Say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're those kind of Christians that believe in God. And dad looks over at the, his son sitting next to me. He said, well, I guess God got the, the email or the, the airmail. And he sent us somebody who could tell us about God. That's a true story, by the way. And why should we find that incredible? Now, before we get to our text for today, which is on this whole subject of service, and I, I'll come back to this about the car wash, these folks were out there serving, just serving, and because they were available, God used them. Now, the passage of Scripture we're getting to is kind of at the end of a two-chapter chunk. And I want you to see what happens here. You know, you sort of get this bookend of meathead disciples and Jesus teaching about children and how the meatheads do with it. So, this is what happens. First of all, uh, Jesus says, now, I'm going to have to go to the cross and die. Well, the disciples have no clue what that's about. You know, they're thinking... Surely he doesn't really mean that has to happen. And they're going on the way, and Jesus says, Now, what were you guys talking about back there? Well, the guys start shuffling around, looking at their feet, because Jesus knows they've been talking about which one of us is going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, and you can just picture what that conversation was like. And Jesus says, Now, let me teach you what it's really like in the kingdom of heaven. The greatest is not the one who gets to the top. The greatest is the one who gets down and serves. Matter of fact, and he, there's a kid going by, and he says, See this kid here? One who welcomes this child welcomes me. 
Now, we go over to the next chapter. This is the next chapter. And there are a bunch of parents who come with their children for Jesus to lay his hands on them and bless them. Now, remember what Jesus said. Whoever welcomes one of these little children welcomes me. What do the disciples do when the parents show up with their kids? They shoo them away and say, Jesus is too busy for children. And I know Jesus is going, Father, this is not going well. These the disciples just aren't getting it. He just told them, welcome children, you welcome me. They turn away children. Jesus is saying, Gah. And then the next story Two of the disciples come to him, James and John, and say, Hey, Jesus, we got a request. We want to have one of us standing, uh, seated at your right hand, one at the left. And Jesus is thinking, they're still not getting this whole idea of serving. You know what they're like? They're like, a, it came across this little account of a child who at the end of breakfast, something came to his mind, and so he got a piece of paper, and he thought, I'm doing a lot of work around here, and I deserve to be paid for this stuff. So he wrote down, raking the yard, five bucks. Cleaning my room, two bucks. Taking out the trash, three bucks. Total, ten dollars, and left it beside the plate. When he showed up at lunch, Mom had another piece of paper sitting beside the plate. And it said, fixing all your meals, no charge. Caring for you when you're sick, no charge. Taking you to all of your, wherever you need to be driven, no charge. You get the picture? What a contrast between that, hey, I deserve this, and the simple act of loving service that asks not what am I getting out of it, but what am I giving and what makes a difference. Well, let's go to our scripture today, and it's that fourth story that I just alluded to briefly, and let's read together this from uh, Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. In another translation, it says, we want you to do whatever we ask. Now, you've got to give them some credit for being bold. Well, what is your request, he asked. They replied, well, when you sit in your glor on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and one on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with a baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied. We are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the other ten disciples heard about James, what James and John had asked, they were indignant. Jesus called them together and said, guys, listen. You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those who are under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus then goes on from here to demonstrate practically what this service looks like in three very practical ways. First of all, he washes their feet in the upper room. Secondly, he prays for them in Gethsemane. And third, he goes to the cross and gives his life for them there. I came across a wonderful passage about Jesus washing the feet of the disciples from Max Lucado. And I'd like to read this for you. It's, it's wonderfully written and has so much insight in it. In Jesus' day, the washing of feet was a task reserved not just for the servants, but for the lowest of servants. Every circle has its pe pecking order, and the circle of household workers was no exception. The servant at the bottom of the totem pole was expected to be the one on his knees with a towel and basin. 
In this case, the one with the towel and basin is the king of the universe. Hands that shape the stars now wash away filth. Fingers that formed mountains now massage toes. And the one before whom all nations will one day kneel now kneels before his disciples. Hours before his own death, Jesus' concern is singular. He wants his disciples to know how much he loves them. More than removing dirt, Jesus is removing doubt. Jesus knows what will happen to his hands at the crucifixion. Within 24 hours, they will be pierced and lifeless. Of all the times we'd expect him to ask the disciples' attention, this would be one, but he doesn't. You can be sure Jesus knows the future of these feet he is washing. Think about this. These 24 feet will not spend the next day following their master, defending his cause. These feet will dash for cover at the flash of a Roman sword. Only one pair of feet won't abandon him in the garden. One disciple won't desert him at Gethsemane. Judas won't even make it that far. He will abandon Jesus that very night at the table. And listen to this. I looked for a Bible translation that reads, Jesus washed all the disciples' feet except the feet of Judas. But I didn't find one. What a passionate moment when Jesus silently lifts the feet of his betrayer and washes them in the basin. Within hours the feet of Judas, cleansed by the kindness of the one who, uh, who he will betray, uh, will stand at Caiaphas' court. Behold the gift Jesus gives his followers. He knows what these men are about to do. He knows they are about to perform the vilest act of their lives. By morning, they will bury their heads in shame and look down at their feet in disgust. And when they do, he wants them to remember how his knees knelt before them and he washed their feet. He wants them to realize those feet are still clean. In John, Jesus said, You don't understand now what I'm doing, but you will understand later. Remarkable. He forgave their sin before they even committed it. He offered mercy before they even sought it. This is the servant heart of our Savior. Jesus knelt and washed their feet. When we serve others, we are doing what Christ has called us to do. Take a look at this up here. I've got a little formula here on servant evangelism. Evangelism means sharing the good news, and this is what it looks like. Servant evangelism equals, and here's your you got little, uh, little uh, outline, deeds of love. Remember the guys uh, doing the car wash? Words of love. We're just doing this because we want you to know God loves you, and adequate time. They could have been doing something else, but they chose to take the time to be out there just to be available to God and available to let other people know that God loved them. One of the most moving things that's happened to me this week is uh, I was a part of a group that Rusty and Barbara Griffin invited out to their place to talk about the Kairos ministry. That's our ministry to people who are in prison. It was very moving because the people talked they had several speakers lined up, and there were a couple of volunteers who were going into the prison who talked. And then there were a couple of guys who had been in prison and gone through the Kairos program while they were in the prison, and now they'd been released. And they spoke. Well, I'm telling you, it was so powerful because one of them said, uh, and all of the guys, by the way, who come to one of these weekends, they're thinking the same thing, but they don't necessarily just blurt it out like this guy did. But he said, I just asked when we got sitting around the table, I said, so what are you guys doing here? What's your angle? What are you after? He said, they answered and said, we just came here to show you God's love. Okay, but, but what are you getting out of it? I mean, why are you doing it? And they said, we're just coming here to show God's love. And he said, by the time we got to the end of that weekend, I knew that these guys were right. They really had come here just to show us God's love. And then another guy stood up, and uh, he said, you know, not one of the people on the outside coming in as volunteers, not one of them when they were there asked me what I'd done. And I kept thinking, I wonder why that is. And finally he said, it came to me, they don't care what I did. It doesn't matter what I've done. 
They're here to show God's love anyway. And I thought, wow, when people come with a servant heart and do something about it, deeds of love, words of love, adequate time, when they do that, people see God at work and they feel the hand of God touching them. I've gone into a prison. I was invited one time uh, early on to come and speak to them. Now, when you get into prison, they have a hug line. You all know what a hug line is. You know, all the folks from the outside who are in there, we just get in line, and all of the, the folks on the inside, the residents, they come by, and, you know, you give them a hug, pat them on the back, and they go through. Now, I was just there as, you know, the preacher that they invited in to talk and blah, blah, blah. And the guys all hugged me. But I tell you, I was watching, and I could tell as these guys were going through the line, they knew the ones who came through on every Monday night. They weren't just here for the weekend. Every Monday night, they were there. Every Monday night, loving on these guys. And I could look and see these guys knew the ones who were giving up their time on a consistent basis and coming to love on them. And I thought, here is the grace of God that is manifest so richly and so clearly. Take a look at another uh, definition of servant evangelism. It goes like this. Servant evangelism is, look, four things. Demonstrating the kindness of God by offering to do some act of humble service with no strings attached. It's normal for those inside the church to serve those who are outside the church. We ought not think anything is odd about that. Free service offers a perfect picture of God's grace. It's something that can't be repaid. And it starts out just doing simple things. All of us can do this. Have you stopped to think about this? Jesus started his disciples off with simple stuff. Let me ask you a question. This is not a trick question. When Jesus fed the 5,000, who did the miracle of multiplying all the the stuff? Jesus did, okay? But who organized the people to sit down in groups of 50? Who took the food out to the folks? Who collected the baskets of leftovers? The disciples did this. Jesus let them be a part of his work by doing some simple things. We can do acts of service like this that will impact folks and will make a difference in their lives. Steve Shogren is one of the guys who really helped initiate this. He's a pastor up in Cincinnati, and he's the one that uh, told that first story about the airmail about. He does something. I'm still trying to get the courage to do this, and I'm, maybe there's somebody here who's saying, when you hear this, you think, I'm all about that, and you're going to come up and talk to me, and we'll go do this together. But they have a potty ministry. And these guys will go with a bucket filled with all of the supplies, brush in hand, and they'll go to a strip mall or business. They'll go in, walk up to the manager and say, hey, we're here to show the love of God in a practical way. Could we clean your toilets for you? And, of course, the question people ask is, Why are you doing this? And they say, we just want to show you in a practical way the love of God. And they go and clean the toilets. Do you think that maybe gets people's attention? Has anybody ever done that for that business person before? The answer to that would be no. It's a practical way of serving wherever there is a need. This morning, as I was preparing, you know, and getting ready, God reminded me of one area that I had forgotten, a practical area of need, and that is in our own homes. I'm telling you, it may be the greatest service God calls us to do is right in our own homes. How easy is it for us to say, well, my spouse didn't, blah, 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 blah. And God's saying, would you be willing to be a servant And why don't you go ahead and do... Well, it's not fair. Is that... It's not fair. Do you find that in this story about Jesus? He's always there with a servant heart to love and to give. And I'm telling you, in our marriages, if we would concentrate on serving one another, all the marriage counselors would be put out of business. Well, here fighting for my rights. 
But Jesus gives us a new way. And so it ought to be in our, our homes that we serve. And then it ought to be in our places of work that we do our that's where we spend, you know, most of our time during the day. That's one place. When people see our work, they ought to know we're doing it not for our boss, but we're doing it for our Savior, and we ought to do our very best. There's one more place uh, that I, I feel like it's important for us to hear, and that is we ought to serve wherever people are hurting. And I want you to take a look at this video uh, about one of the people in our own church that has stepped up to meet a, a need where there is a place of hurt. Listen to Wendy Chandler. You know, all around us there are people who just want to know, does somebody care? And in simple acts of service, we can share the love of Christ that can help to change somebody's life. Would you pray with me? Father, we just confess how much we want to be served. I hate to admit that, but we like being served. But we're coming today to ask that the Holy Spirit will do something in our hearts that will change us and give us the heart of Jesus, the heart that says, how can I serve and touch a life around me? So today... We thank you for what you are doing to help make us more like Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand together and let's just sing one verse of our closing hymn, which is, O Master, let me walk with thee. And let's talk together to God and worship him. Oh, Master, let I always love watching the acolytes because they do such a great job coming up here in a special way of serving the Lord. And Charlie, how about let's turn back around here. How about put that out? Okay. So, you know, part of what we do, though, is we put, we put that out so we don't burn the church down. That happened, the church burned down in 1902, and we're doing good since then. So, however, they are taking the light out into the world, and that is our calling every time that we are sent out into the world. So, my prayer for today has been that all of us would hear what God is saying to us. Somebody came out after the early service and said, there's something I've been putting off, and God told me, come on, do it. Well, that's a good thing. Would you join hands with each other? And as you're joining hands, you're reaching out and touching someone who is going to make a difference by caring in a practical way for those who are around them. So, brothers and sisters, would you be faithful to Christ? Listen, your faithfulness is about how God will use you to touch somebody. There's somebody who needs to know that God cares. And you, through your simple act of service, will make that difference. So go in God's grace, and may the grace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. Amen. Well, there you have it. The greatest are those who serve, says Jesus. And I have come not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Well, could we have the courage to follow Jesus? If we do, we'll discover that God works in us and allows us to be a part of the greatest mission of service in the world, and that is pointing people to Jesus.